It's wonderful to gather and as God's community, as God's people, to gather to worship the Lord together this morning. We hope that you are blessed this morning as we gather and as we worship together. I'd like for us to stand as I read our call to worship. It's found in Matthew chapter 11. God's scripture says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light.
Good morning. I think you'd do better. I learned a lot last week. Good morning. Good morning. If you are visiting us this morning, we would like to welcome you to Western Springs Baptist Church and ask that you fill out a contact card, which you could find in front of you, in the pew ahead of you. And then you can fill it out and put it in the offering plate a little later in the service. We have some special guests with us today, our missionary partners, Mark and Michelle Engel. Can you wave, please? There they are. They serve with Muslim Outreach. Be sure to uh, connect with them and talk with them after service today and find out how things are going with them. We here have many opportunities for all ages. 
we to join Bible studies, prayer meetings, and fellowship. We hope you're excited to be a part of these programs. A new core class will start on November 6th. Have you ever been told or have you ever felt like you weren't enough and you have to work harder to earn more money, to, claim higher, to climb higher and be better? What if our primary calling was not to be successful, but to be faithful? Well, come and find out what God's perfect plan for your life is as we study the mystery of grace, written by Anad Mahadevan, facilitated by Bruce McKenzie. So that will start on November 6th. Be sure to join. Our youth had perfect weather yesterday and a great time at Pastor Aaron's. I understand that Pastor Steve makes a great hot chocolate. I personally have not tried it yet, but maybe I'll get an invite. <clears throat> Their next outing will be on Saturday, November 9th. They're going to a water park day to Great Wolf Lodge. They're going to have a great time. Baptism Sunday is November 17th. If you are interested in taking the next step in your faith walk with Christ and proclaim your faith and commitment to follow him through baptism, then contact the church office or speak with Pastor Joel. Parents, this would be a wonderful opportunity to encourage your children to take that next step if they are ready. I'm going to ask Henry Manassi, our church moderator, to come and share an important announcement about a change in our search committee. Good morning, church. I think uh, most of you are quite familiar with uh, our missionary partners in Thailand, Chris and Becky Hurt and their children. Uh, we received some very sad news that uh, Chris's lymphoma has recurred and he's had to come back to the United States for treatment at a uh, <clears throat> medical center in Michigan. Chris and Becky are the children of John and Peggy Hurt and John has been the faithful chairman of the search committee for our senior pastor. And with all of this going on with Chris, uh, John has felt that he needs to be with his family and support with the children and uh, has asked to be relieved of his duties as chair of the search committee. Uh, we, of course, accepted that resignation and have asked Don Nelson to be the replacement chair. So effective immediately, Don continues on the work. And let me just say, the work just continues. Uh, we're not missing any steps in this. We also have a resignation, someone who is planning to uh, leave this area. So that replacement will be Alice Irizarry. And Alice is already stepping in. And the, again, the search continues. Uh, they've been meeting since last year. Uh, candidates continue to come forward, and uh, with the work of that committee, there's, of course, the typical scrutiny and review, uh, but I'm confident that uh, under Dawn's leadership, things will continue as normal. And uh, again, continue to pray for the search committee. I know they cover your prayers. Uh, and continue your prayers for the Hurt family as well. Uh, this is a difficult situation for everybody, and uh, I know that they will appreciate uh, the prayer of the congregation. That's it. Before we continue on worship, I'd like to make a special announcement. Uh, Scott Kaviz, this is his last Sunday here. Scott is out in the foyer right now. Uh, and, but Scott has also been serving our church faithfully for many years. But he is moving to Texas, and this is his last Sunday with, uh, with us. So I'm just encouraged to meet him and talk with him afterwards and just bless him as he goes off uh, to Texas. Uh, we will miss you, Scott, as well. Um, I'd like to invite the ushers to come up during this next song. This next song, we're going to invite you to sing with us uh, the chorus. Um, it's a wonderful song uh, Jessica found. It's called King of Love. And we hope you enjoy and hope you feel blessed this morning. King of 
love my shepherdess Whose goodness faileth never I nothing lack if I am his And he is mine forever And he is mine forever We're streams of living water flow My ransom soul he Such 
Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sin, nor repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord. O oh, you, his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
such a pleasure to have Karen and Mark Leckis to come and share with us this morning. I've asked Mark Leckis to uh, share a, a piece uh, with Lisa. It's called The Mission, but it has the melody of How Great Thou Art in it. I wanted to give you this an opportunity to continue in worship with such beautiful instrumentation this morning. Good morning, church. It's good to be back here with you again. I was thinking as we were enjoying that music, what would life be like if we didn't have music? If we didn't have the ability to sing, it would just be a whole completely different life. So thankful for the musicians and the gifts that God has given to uh, so many in our congregation here. And if you belong up there, I hope you'll join them. I want to thank you for your prayers for our group as we were in Greece and Turkey. Uh, we had a wonderful, wonderful time together. Here's a picture of the group from uh, Western Springs and several other surrounding churches here from Chicagoland, but about two-thirds of that were from Western Springs. And then we had a group from Texas join us too, so a total group of 76. A large group, and we had a wonderful time, and thank you for your prayers. I did enjoy listening to the messages that you heard while I was gone. Uh, Tal did an excellent job, and Pastor Wilson last week did an excellent job. In fact, uh, 
I was sort of intimidated a little bit by some of the things he said. Um, he said that he was tall, dark, and handsome, and so where does that leave me? I'm not particularly tall. I'm a little darker from being in Greece for the last week or so. Uh, at least my wife says I'm handsome, so I guess I'll just have to go with, with those things. We are uh, glad to be back and launching into our study this morning in the book of First Thessalonians. Last time we were together, several weeks ago, I shared with you the story about a man by the name of, well, his nickname was Son of Encouragement. Son of Encouragement. Joseph was his name, but he went mostly by Barnabas. And uh, Barnabas was Paul's companion in his first missionary journey. And Barnabas looked for every opportunity he came across to share encouraging words, no matter which situation he was in. And I want you to notice that Barnabas seized opportunities. It wasn't just that they presented themselves to him. Barnabas stepped out of comfort zones. Barnabas stepped into situations where encouragement was needed, whether it was comfortable for him or not, and whether it was going to cost him something or not. We get started our, um, as we get started this morning our study, I'd like to do a little self-evaluation. Just some questions. Three weeks ago, you were encouraged to find ways to encourage others. How has it been? In fact, in the last year, what would you say, how many, how many people would say, so-and-so brought encouraging words my way? They lifted my load. They brought shade to a very difficult time in my life. It was like a, a f cup of fresh water. It was given to me by the encouraging words or actions of so-and-so. Would they mention your name in that? You see, all of us need encouraging words. All of us are helped along in the journey of life with encouraging words. But one of the things that many of us miss out on is this. We're not looking for the opportunity to encourage others. And so we miss out on the encouragement that comes our way as we have the privilege of encouraging others. We go on our way. We go on through, day, through our day at work, at school, at home, wherever it is, never even aware of the opportunities because we haven't taken the time to allow God to make us aware of the opportunities that are coming our way. So one of the way, ways that God wants us to live our lives is to be, look, be looking for what he is doing in life and people around us and what he wants us to be a part of. So how does that happen? How do we become encouragers if that's not our bent, if that's not the way in which we've been living our lives already? It becomes natural. It becomes a part of who you are if you're willing to begin by asking the Lord to open your eyes and make you aware of the needs of the people around you. You know where it would be a good place to start? With your family. Each morning, Praying for your children, praying for your spouse, praying for your friends. Lord, I have no idea what they're going to need today. I have no idea what they're facing. I don't know what battles are going on in their heads right now. But would you give me the words? Would you give me the actions that will encourage them one step closer to you? Would you give me the words that would bring someone who does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior one step closer to making that life-transforming decision? It begins by prayer. And you know what? You might be wondering, what will the words be? God will give them to you. What will the actions be? God will give them to you. I want to encourage you. Start with prayer. Lord, how can I today encourage someone? And it's not always close friends and close family. It could be someone you've never seen before. Someone you meet at the grocery store, or someone you meet at a restaurant or at work, or wherever. And God will give you just the right word, just the right action. 
that will cause them to understand their need of the Lord in their lives. This morning, we begin our study in the book of 1 Thessalonians, and I've titled it, Be Prepared. And the reason is, this small book has 20 different references to the second coming of Christ. So it's, it's, it's challenging these new believers and saying, hey, Christ is going to come back. You need to be prepared for that. There's some preparation that you can do for Christ's return, and it'll make a huge difference in your life if you're aware of and are looking forward to the return of Christ. And so as we study our, our, uh, this book of 1 Thessalonians, we'll be looking for uh, the different references to Christ's return. As Paul writes this, and I'll fill you in a little bit more as we go, as Paul writes this book, he is excited about encouraging new believers in the church of Thessalonica. This group has uh, not been together very long, They're brand new believers, and facing some very special challenges. Thessalonica was a prominent seaport back in the day of, uh, of uh, Paul, and uh, it was the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia. Today it's called Thessaloniki, and there's about, it's the second largest city in Greece, has about 310,000 people in it. During the World War, Second World War, the Nazis came in, rounded up the 60,000 Jews in Thessaloniki, and sent them off to uh, extermination. Paul's day, in Paul's day, this city was mostly Greek, but did have a small group of influential Jewish people. And we are uh, going to be studying this, what happened during the second missionary journey, which is Paul and Silas, uh, as they came to Thessalonica. I'd like you to turn with me in your Bibles to Thessalonians 1. And we're going to begin this morning by reading through this first 10 verses of 1 Thessalonians 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy. To the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. Remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with a Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with a joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model of all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Paul, Silas, Timothy. Although this letter is written by Paul, he had companions. He had those who traveled with him who were part of the ministry. The, third, the church in Thessalonica was familiar to Paul because Paul and Silas, as well as Luke, had labored there. They arrived from Philippi. Now, sometimes when we think about Paul and his missionary journeys, we think of him as traveling joyfully. You know, he's got his uh, backpack probably, and he's got his robe, and he's just in great health as he's going from one place to another. But the picture when he came into Thessalonica was not that. He was beat up. And I'm not just talking about tired. I'm talking about literally beat up. He had been in Philippi. And if you remember what happened in Philippi, falsely accused, thrown into jail. But it wasn't just into jail. By the way, I've heard pastors over the years say something like this. The first place Paul went every time he went into a new town was to check out the jail because he knew sooner or later he was going to land up in it. 
But in this case, I want you to hear and read with me in Acts 16. Acts 16. What happened to Paul as he was actually getting ready to leave Philippi and head to Thessalonica? Acts 16, beginning with verse 22. They were falsely accused. And it says here, The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Now, flogging and being beaten with rods sometimes took the life of the person. So this was not just a gentle tap of, hey, you guys, knock it off. This was a beating, a severe beating. They were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Verse 24, when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. When I was a child, I can remember my father reading this story. We had devotions every night after supper, just being fascinated with the story. The best part of the story comes in the next verses, beginning with verse 25. As Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them, suddenly there was a, such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison was shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open, everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas very quickly said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. I'll think about this just for a minute. If you had been severely, severely beaten, and then just a few hours later, the one who had commanded you to be beaten was about to take their life. Would you stop them? Would you step in? Would you be concerned about their soul? That was Paul. That's the kind of man he was. That's the kind of love he had. So Paul and Silas leave, for, leave uh, Philippi and head to Thessalonica. There's something special about those that God calls us to work with. Within a church like this, as some projects becomes needed, an opportunity to minister in different settings in different ways, recognize that when God gives you a burden to step out and gives someone else a burden to respond in that same area, he also has something he wants to be doing between the two of you. Those who are in the choir and the music know that they benefit in wonderful ways as they prepare the music. God does a work in their hearts in preparation. And those who work with the children and the youth group and, and seniors ministries or whatever other ministries there are, as you work together, there's something that happens. There's a vibrancy that happens. That's why it's so important that each of us recognize the place that God has for us and we step in or become a part of the different ministries that God has gifted us to do. And if you're not doing that, you're robbing yourself and the church. If you're one of those who just comes to church on Sunday mornings, you're not involved anywhere. You're not using your gifts in any way at all. You're cheating yourself. You're robbing God of being able to accomplish what he designed, you to, designed for you and what he desires to see happening in your life and in your family. It goes in so many different directions. Paul, our first and second Thessalonians, are some of the earliest books, most likely the earliest books of Paul's writings. There are those who would say Galatians might have been before them, but either way, they're right in the very early ones. 
after a very short period of time in Thessalonica, which really amazes me every time I read this, in um, Acts 17, 2, it tells us that he preached in the synagogue three Sundays. Now, some people have assumed that that means Paul only was there for three weeks or so. We don't know. It could have been that he just preached in the synagogue for three Sundays. Things got so rough there that he started ministering to the Gentiles for a while before he left. But either way, the believers there believe that Paul was in danger again, and so they sent him away. And so Paul went from there to Athens with Timothy. And after a while of being in, in Athens, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how the new believers were doing. And once, they, once um, Paul, Timothy found out the information, he headed back to Athens, found out that by now uh, Paul had gone to Corinth, which is where he wrote First and Second Thessalonians. Paul loved these new believers. He was very concerned about them because of the issues that they were facing. And a church that was less than a year old, it was amazing what they had already learned. As we work our way through this book, we're going to see that he talked about very clearly the great truths of the Christian faith. There was a clear picture in their minds of what salvation was all about, what sanctification was all about, what assurance was all about. As we listen to the songs this morning, leaning on the everlasting arms. An old hymn, an old hymn that in many congregations is long gone, long forgotten. But what a powerful truth for us. We are secure in him, leaning in his arms, resting there until the very end. What a privilege to walk through life, not with our fingers crossed saying, boy, do I hope I make it into heaven. But looking ahead and saying, I have a home prepared for me because I know who my Savior is. I know where I'm going to spend eternity, no matter what this life has to offer, because I know who my Savior is. And if you're here today and you've never come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, my prayer for you this morning was that today you will understand your need and today, you will open your heart and receive the free gift, free gift given to you by the grace of God. We had such beautiful songs about His grace extended to us today. His grace, His faithful grace, always there for us. At the time that this church was, was uh, established, they probably had the Old Testament available to them through some of those who were Hebrews. So they had the Old Testament to study, but very little of the New Testament. So Paul greets them right from the start with these warm, warm words, grace and peace. As he opens up, he says, my wish for you is that you would understand the magnitude of God's grace. The magnitude of what he has done for you. The magnitude of what he wants to continue to do for you. The magnitude of what he's promised to do for you in the future. He says, I want you to not just mentally understand his grace. I want you to live in his grace. I want you to drink in his grace. And when you do, one of the results of understanding and drinking in his grace will be his peace. How much is that true in your home today? Is your home a place of peace? Is your home a place where people just come walking in from all different walks of life and all the different situations and they sense, here is someone who has been touched by something that I haven't experienced. Here's someone who is walking in the grace of God. Here's someone who has something I need. My prayer for you this morning, every one of you, was that you would experience in a new way God's grace in your life. And as a result of it, that your home would be a place of peace. I have loved the stories 
of people who have shared how they came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And many times it was someone at work, someone at school, some neighbor, some friend, whatever, who they knew had something they didn't have. No matter what situation this person was going through in life, they knew there was something they had. And they had to find it. God brought peace and grace to them through salvation. Well, I uh, hastily went through the first point of our um, outline, and that's team ministry, team, T-E-A-M. Paul was working as a team, and he recognized the value of the different men with the different gifts and invited them to come and be part of his ministry. The second point here is thankful, a thankful ministry. And let's go back here just for verses 2 and 3 again and read how he put it. He said, we, his team, we always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your enduring in endurance inspired by hope. Making mention of you in my prayers. A couple years ago, Julie and I hung up the phone and just looked at each other at what we had just heard. We had talked for the last time with a 99-year-old woman who said to us, and we knew we were saying goodbye, She said, I want you to know that I have faithfully prayed every day for each of you and every one of your children by name and every one of your grandchildren by name. Now, I knew this woman. I knew that what she was telling me was the truth because she could name all of my grandchildren, all nine of them. And she could name not just my sons, but my daughters in love. Faithful prayers. Who is counting on your prayers today? Who knows that you pray for them every day? Who knows that you lift them up in their need, in their struggles? Paul is saying, we love you and we pray for you faithfully, by name, by need, by issue. This morning, I got a text from a young man who was in my high school group back in the 80s. Pastor Don, I'm praying for you this morning as you preach the word. That kind of stuff can't be bought. That kind of relationships don't just come. impacts us and makes us stronger. It encourages us. And I want you to recognize your need to be involved. Your need to pray for others. Your need to lift them up, hold them up. Under the point two here, we have three different ones. And the first one is faith. Paul encouraged them in their faith. The way that faith had impacted their lives. He says, I love the fact that you guys are doers. You just don't, not just hearers, you're not just comprehending what faith is all about. But you are someone who has allowed God to change you by the faith that you have placed in him and that has made you become doers of what God has called you to do. You're not just, not just those who profess faith, but you are doers. Philippians 2.13 says, It is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. And here in, Gal- in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, verse 10, let me read 2, 8 and 9 first, which is so familiar to us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus for what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The good works don't make us believers. The good works are the results of what God has done in our lives. And if there's no good works there, if God isn't challenging you to new heights, to new adventures, to new challenges, then you need to ask yourself, why? Am I truly a born-again believer? And if I am, then what is standing in the way of me seeing and understanding what God wants for me? You see, sometimes as a pastor, I find myself saying, is there any way I can help some of you wake up to what you're missing out on? Is there any way, anything I can say today that the Lord would lead me to, to, to say that would challenge you to the place where you say, you know what? Enough of this criticism stuff. Enough of finding fault in every other situation. Enough of finding excuses for not doing. About time for me to find a reason for getting involved in a way that God can honor and God can bless. The next one is love, under B. Their love for Jesus impacted the lives their lives and the lives of each other. First Thessalonians 5, I was, I'm sorry, First Thessalonians 4, beginning with verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, do so. More and more. Hey, you're doing a pretty good job. You guys are known for the way in which you love each other. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let up. More and more. Find new ways. Find powerful expressions of love, especially for brothers and sisters in Christ. He's talking about unearned love. Agape love. He says, the kind of love he's asking us to do is loving people who are unlovable, unlovely, unkind, inconsiderate, who don't do it our way, who don't say it our way, who don't look at us in the right way sometimes. He's saying, love them no matter what. I heard a story of a man who was living with his family down in South America. And he met a man by the name of Mario, who was a Marxist, an intellectual, who wanted nothing to do with Christ. But Jim just kept going to him as, as a friend, getting together for a cup of coffee, getting together just to do things. They moved to what part and a couple years later, they met again. And Mario said, I've come to know Christ as my Savior. And Jim said, how did it happen? He said, it was my last visit with you in your home. And Jim couldn't remember anything about it. He said, yeah, I had soup with your family. And I watched your wife and your children and I thought, I will never have what this man has if I continue on the path that I'm on. I want this. And he went back, moved away, and then received Christ as Savior. Now Jim went home and talked to his wife. And she reminded him that that night... In the presence of Mario, both of them had corrected their children several times who were misbehaving that night. <laughs> you know what that says? You don't have to have a perfect home. You don't have to have a perfect life. But if you're willing to model to the best of your ability with the Lord's strength, he will use it for his glory. The next thing we see here is hope. 
Hope that keeps us going in tough times. Hope that keeps us going when the path ahead is not very clear. Hope is what every one of us need. As we look ahead, the steadfast anticipation of God stepping in, giving direction, God being there for us no matter what. Warren Wiersbe said, faith, hope, and love are the three cardinal virtues of the Christian life, the three greatest evidences of salvation having taken place. Point number three, transformational ministry. Look with me back here in 1 Thessalonians again, verses 4 and 5. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sakes. Paul celebrated their salvation. Paul loved helping them become aware of the differences, the, the complete change that had come into their lives. And he celebrated with them. Second Thessalonians 2.13 says this, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, through belief in his truth. There's some people who get scared of the whole thought of God having chosen us. I only have problems with that when I find people go, outside of the realm of what the, I believe the Bible teaches here. Yes, God knew every one of us who were going to come to, to know Christ as Savior. God chose us in his infinite wisdom. God of the universe. If you accept the fact that he created the universe by just speaking it into existence, how is it hard for you to believe that God chose you and already knew who was going to make that decision? But God also gives us, just like we heard this morning, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, Steve and I did not sit down and work our way through my message this morning and he chose songs for it. God chose those songs. My prayer for you this morning is that you would understand the work that God desires to do in your life. That you would understand that he wants you to be walking with the Holy Spirit's direction and leading. And that he has a task for you. And that task is every day. So my challenge would be to start waking up in the morning and saying, Lord, today, in which way do you want the light of Jesus Christ to shine through me? In what ways would you allow me to be a part of encouraging someone else who doesn't even know you to take one step closer to you? What, in what ways today do you want me to be aware of what's going on in my family's life, my spouse's wife, that they need those words of encouragement or actions of encouragement? A.W. Tozer said this, a church in the land without the Spirit is rather a curse than a blessing. If you have not the Spirit of God, Christian worker, remember that you are in somebody else's way. You are a fruitless tree standing where a fruit tree might grow. So if we're not walking with the Lord, in tune with him, we're standing in the way of what God wants. And if today you're not walking with the Lord where you need to be, you're standing in the way of what God wants to do in your family and your friends and those around you. Because if you were where God wanted you to be, you'd be having an impact on all of them around you. So the challenge this morning is, how am I in tune with what God desires to accomplish so that he could use me for his glory, to encourage his family and those around us. Let's close in a word of prayer. 
Father, I thank you for being an amazing, amazing God. And I thank you for the blessing we have of this morning being ministered to in so many different ways. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for Jesus Christ who died to make our lives with you possible. Thank you for the security we have in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for those who this morning say, I'm just not sure I could really point to too many places where my encouragement has impacted somebody else. Lord, help them to wake up. Help them to understand what they're missing out on. I pray for those, Lord, here today who have never received Jesus Christ as Savior. Going to church is a formality. It's something they've just gotten into the habit of doing, but there's never been that life-transforming work. I pray that today, before they leave this place, they would give us the privilege of sharing with them how they can know where their eternal home is going to be, how they can know today that you are their Savior and the Holy Spirit is their constant companion. And Father, may none of us cheat those around us, especially the ones you've called us to pray for and lift up and give shade to and give that cold cup of cold water to let us be faithful to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise from Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Just one more request. Would you not be the first one out the doors today? Would you make sure that you shake hands with at least two people you don't really know before you leave? Thanks. Lord bless.